I'm so thrilled to see you all here today. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been three long years since we last held this Fall Public Service Awards Dinner, but I'm so happy to revive this tradition. I know for many of our graduating third year students, it's your first ever Fall Public Service Awards Dinner, when really it should have been your third, but thank you for being here. Um, you know, as many of you know, the Levin Center is focused on building a robust and cohesive public interest community. And I think um, when you look around this room, you look at the students, the faculty, the staff, the alumni who are here, it really reminds you how so many of us um, have supported one another through difficult times, both remotely and in person, and I'm just so happy that we're all in the room together tonight. Um, <laughs> You know, our mission is to encourage all of our students to incorporate public service into your careers, whether it's as a full-time career or via a robust pro bono practice. And I hope as you hear the stories of the two lawyers tonight, the students in the room will, will reflect about how you, too, might have an impact on the world after you graduate. Um, I also want to take a moment to recognize Terry Levin, who recently passed away. I first met Terry and her husband John about 15 years ago when the Levin Center was first created. Um, they had an ambitious vision of how we could redefine what a commitment to public service means. And I think our goal from the beginning has been to encourage every Stanford Law School student to think about how public service can be part of your career. And I know that Stanford would not be what it is today without the Levin Center and the ambitious vision that Terry and John laid out for us. So I want to just take a moment to, to think of Terry and John. We have a fantastic program for you tonight. I'm so excited to hear more from our two honorees, Nena Gupta and Sylvia Argueta. And I also want to just take a moment to, to encourage you to, to come and meet them afterwards. I think they're both fantastic and inspiring role models. And I also hope throughout the dinner you've had a chance to talk with some of the students, faculty, and staff at your tables. You know, this is a very special community, and I think it is so because of the people who are here, the stories that you have to share, and the experiences that you have. So I hope that some of the conversations you have tonight might lead to new friendships and possibly future collaborations. So thank you very much, and we'll move on to Diane. Thank you, Anna, for starting off our evening with such wonderful remarks. It really is just such a special feeling to be all together again at this event at which we celebrate the public service of our students and our alumni and our community. So um, I echo Anna's thanks for you all being here. I also just want to take a second to thank the Levin Center staff. Um, Anna and Titi and Mike and Shafik and Melanie and particularly Melanie for pulling this entire event together. Um, I am every day just grateful for the collaboration that we have as a team and the way that we always put at the center of our work the need to support our students and our alumni and to keep this burgeoning community growing as, as much as we can. I'm also really delighted to welcome back several of our most accomplished public interest alumna. Um, Kareen Kendrick, who received this award several years ago, Jenny Chang Newell, who did as well, and Julia Wilson, who received one of our first alumni awards for public interest. So thank you for continuing to inspire generations of public interest lawyers for your work. Now to the task at hand, Ms. Nena Gupta. I am just so excited to bring you back here to honor you in this way. Um, I have known Nena for over a decade somehow, right? Um, and she inspired from the first day. I got to know Nena very well as a student. Um, she was a leader, she was a co-president of SLA. She was a leader in many, many student organizations. She led also by example. She was an amazing participant in one of the first very novel pro bono projects that Debbie Muckamall helped found, where uh, Nana with Debbie provided guidance and support to formerly incarcerated individuals to launch new lives. Um, and it was really wonderful to 
watch Debbie create that project and to watch Nana help her kind of implement it and bring it to fruition. I was delighted, of course, when Nana made the decision to enter public interest full time after her clerkship with Judge Myron Thompson in the Middle District of Alabama. Um, that she chose to work with another Stanford Law alum, Dave Sapp, who also received this award at some point in the last several years, it just occurs to me, um, on education, equity, and racial justice at the ACLU of Northern California. She just did inspiring, amazed, grounded in community work, which is what um, I know she always did as a student, grounded in this community and grounded in the community um, of clients that she was choosing to support. But it was immigrants' rights um, learned at the knee of or next to um, Jayshree Shrikantaya and the Immigrants' Rights Clinic that kept calling her back and kept calling her back. And so Nana then became the immigration defense attorney at the Alameda County Public Defender's Office. Not an easy job, as one can imagine, right? And she brought, again, her fierceness, her compassion, her passion for service to that work. We were kind of neighbors in Oakland when she was doing that work. And we would run into each other, sometimes literally at Lake Merritt, um, when she was doing that work and it inspired her and it was just, um, it was really wonderful to watch her grow in that role. Um, but it's been equally really wonderful to watch her grow in this new role as the Associate Director of Policy at the National Immigration Justice Center where her grounded experience um, in her work as a student with the clinic in her work with the Alameda County Public Defender's Office just brings a wisdom about how policy formulation can and should happen and how policy formulation and strategy must always, always, always have at its heart the impact that it will have on individuals. So that experience, her now current ability to schmooze with the best of them on Capitol Hill, also allows her to think about implementation in a very strategic way. So in her role at NIJC, she has a comprehensive approach to moving the needle on behalf of immigrants who are in detention, who have been wrongfully deported, and who interact with the criminal legal system in ways that she knows very, very well from her work with her clients. For those of you who have had the opportunity to meet Nana today, and for those of you who will be grateful to meet with her tomorrow, and for those of us in the community who have known her and loved her for so long, you know she just lights up any room that she's in. Um, and I just want to say that um, she lit up my life the entire time she was at this law school, and we're so grateful for the example that you give to our community and the light that you bring to all of us. So thank you, Nina, and I'm honored to present this award. I have to move it up, so. <laughs> uh, th yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Diane, so much. Uh, crazily, it was ten over 10 years ago that I was sitting uh, where many of you as first and second year students uh, are sitting this evening. And I think what's true is that when you love what you do and you believe in it deeply, time goes by quickly. Uh, and for that, I am so grateful to the Levin Center for all they have done to support this community um, and this work. Your support has allowed me to take meaningful risks with my career uh, and to be creative in the advocacy that I take on for my clients. And I'm so grateful for that. Uh, also, my commitment to social justice is born from the women on the maternal side of my family. I come from a long line of fierce and brave Indian women, including my very favorite cousin and aunt who are here this evening. Thank you and I love you. <laughs> um, 
Tonight, for any of you who are sitting close, you can see that I am wearing a big pink ring with my name on it. I still remember very clearly the moment that 19-year-old Joseph gave me this present, which he made from shreds of plastic given to him by a jail guard at the Yuba County Jail north of Sacramento. He held up the ring behind the plexiglass that separated us in our first attorney-client meeting, and he said, I know you are working hard on my case. I have to get home to my baby sister who will be born soon. It doesn't make sense that I'm here. I think this is a mistake. For the next three years, together, Joseph and I would face the full extent of injustice of the immigration system before various courts. But Joseph alone would suffer the pain and indignity of nearly three years of prolonged detention in ICE custody which almost cost him his life. Joseph arrived to the US uh, from Guatemala at age six alongside his parents as they fled extreme gang violence. Before then, him, he witnessed the violent deaths of three of his family members who were murdered at hands of the gang Barrio 18 for refusing to join. In the US, growing up nearby here in Hayward, uh, Joseph eventually received DACA a program intended to protect from deportation people without lawful status who had arrived as children. As I speak today, DACA is days away from being gutted entirely by our federal courts and congressional inaction, which will leave around 600,000 people without legal status. DACA recipient Joseph was described as teachers by sweet and as sweet and empathetic. He was an AB honor roll student never in trouble, and always, as his mother would tell me, wanting to help her at home. But somewhere around his 16th birthday, while in his care, Joseph's baby sister choked and died, and he could not save her. Overwhelmed by this new trauma and feeling responsible for the loss of his sister, Joseph turned to marijuana and alcohol, suddenly running with the wrong crowd at school. Joseph's father would later share with me remorsefully that he and his wife turned inward at that time, bearing the gravity of losing a baby while each working two jobs to support their immigrant family. I forgot to pay attention to Joseph. I wasn't there for him. I let him down, Jose said to me. Just days after his 18th birthday, Joseph landed in a car, high on drugs, waiting for an older friend who had instructed Joseph to take over the driver's seat and wait outside an apartment Joseph had never seen before. Joseph eventually went upstairs, entering the apartment, in search of his friend who, unbeknownst to Joseph, was committing burglary. And as the victim, still at home, awoke to this horrifying situation, Joseph and his friend fled, jumping in the car to drive away. This resulted in Joseph's first contact with the US criminal legal system. Two adult convictions at once, one for burglary and the other a DUI. The morning he woke up in jail, sobering up to his new reality, he begged a guard for pen and paper to write an apology letter to the victim. The criminal sentencing judge, noticing the out-of-character moment, noting the out-of-character moment for Joseph, sentenced him to weekends in county jail for three months and substantial community service. Joseph walked out of his last weekend in jail, thinking it would be a fresh start as he worked to get back on track in time to welcome a new baby sister due in just a few months. But Joseph didn't make it home. He walked out to find two Immigration Customs Enforcement officers waiting to arrest, handcuff, and transport him to Yuba County Jail, a county jail that receives federal dollars to incarcerate people in federal immigration custody. The ICE officers knew to wait for Joseph because local police informed them of his release. The local police federal immigration collaboration occurs nationwide and means that black and brown immigrants like Joseph living in over-policed neighborhoods like Hayward are not only more vulnerable to criminal arrest but also to detention and deportation. In that moment, the immigration system decided that Joseph was no longer a DACA dreamer branding him instead a criminal. Stripped of his DACA protection, Joseph was suddenly subject to detention and deportation. 
Over the next two years, I witnessed the profound trauma detention imposed on Joseph. The 20 pound weight loss and gaunt cheekbones, a result of anxiety attacks he suffered as older men in his pod regularly threatened him. Or later, the dead look in his eyes like a walking corpse or zombie, a result of a three drug cocktail prescribed by the jail, which included a heavy antipsychotic inappropriate for Joseph's symptoms. The same exact cocktail prescribed to dozens of our other clients in the jail. And then the middle of the night call I received during one of his forced stints in solitary confinement. When out of breath amidst an anxiety attack, he told me he was questioning his life and whether it was worth living. While Joseph suffered this roller coaster inside, we continued to fight in courts on the outside. Five immigration hearings begging for bond and relief from deportation and two federal petitions demanding basic due process. The never ending nature of the fight was a result of many injustices, including the significant discretion immigration judges wield in making life or death decisions. This made it easy for this anti-immigrant judge to ignore clear legal standards and unrefuted evidence that showed Joseph would most likely be killed by Barrio 18 if deported, just like his young cousin deported merely weeks before. Second, I defended Joseph in a system that offers few procedural or constitutional protections despite the weighty decisions at hand. The judge kept Joseph detained for two years based on a police report full of hearsay and unsubstantiated factual allegations that we could not meaningfully challenge because there is no Sixth Amendment right to confront or federal rules of evidence under which to object. Third, he was detained pursuant to harsh and punitive laws passed at the height of the war on drugs, which authorized the incarceration of immigrants without even a right to periodic hearings to challenge the deprivation of their liberty as they fight their immigration cases. As our losses in immigration court added up in this unjust system, his thoughts of suicide increased. Joseph and his father, uh, unsurprisingly, questioned whether it would be better to accept deportation to Guatemala rather than remain indefinitely in detention through appeals and petitions. As we neared our final options, I hesitantly asked Joseph and his father to give me just one more shot. I waited for a few days and then the call from Joseph. Nana, do you still have the pink ring, he asked. Yes, I have it on my nightstand, Joseph. A long pause. Okay, he said, let's try one more time. An emergency TRO and a third habeas petition later, Joseph finally reunited with his family. Thanks to Joseph, the win we secured in his case would help four others that same year secure release. And almost a year later, tears of relief as the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held that, yeah, Joseph was entitled to relief from deportation. Of course, uh, I want you to glean from Joseph's story the power uh, that your law degree will have in individual lives. But that's the thing about wins in this system. They are at best bittersweet because they always leave you with the sinking feeling of unanswered questions. I thought about the quarterback at my public high school who nearly killed two people drinking and driving, but after serving his sentence, took his scholarship and played football at Virginia Tech. Why couldn't we talk more plainly about the race, about race and class, and how it defines the different experiences of him versus Joseph? How did our country get to this place of such an obsession with punishment that it defaults to punitive responses to broken systems, wasting resources, time, and imposing pain and suffering under the pretense of public safety? How could I help people see that framing some immigrants as good and others as bad missed the point, that my clients with criminal convictions were also fathers to DACA recipient kids who relied upon their parents to thrive, and that sometimes a DACA recipient like Joseph made mistakes that certainly didn't deserve detention, deportation, or death. 
These are the questions I ask now to members of Congress and to key policymakers in Washington, D.C., most of whom have never spent a day in an immigration court or visited an immigration detention facility, whether it's a county jail or a pr prison run by a for-profit company. What I've seen is that it doesn't matter how many memos, draft regulations, or proposed policies we offer. I'm most effective at changing hearts and minds and getting impact when I share Joseph's experience, or better yet, when he or any of our other clients share their stories as advocates in their own right. Just last year, I waited at an airport alongside a U.S. senator and reporters as deported U.S. veteran Howard Bailey returned to the U.S. after 10 years of exile post-deportation for a single marijuana conviction. His result, the return of his result, his return, a result of a video I took of him telling his own story, which went viral on Capitol Hill. His return was another bittersweet victory, as I reflected on the thousands of other immigrants unjustly deported who deserve a chance to come home. What I would ask yeah, each of you as students tonight uh, is to push yourselves, to stay close to the humanity implicated by the law. As SLS students and alum, opportunities to work on complex and interesting legal issues will be plenty. Prestige, influence, power, and money will be yours for the taking. It will be much harder to stay close to the people whose lives are dictated by the constraints of our laws. So do whatever it takes. Pro bono work, community organizing, legal services, or like me, go all in. Because if we fail to be near to the lives of people like Joseph and Howard, to learn from them as they navigate unjust legal systems, we lose our legitimacy and credibility. We become a part of the systems that dictate to so many the limit, limits of their power and their rights. For me, uh, Joseph and the dozens of others directly impacted by our broken immigration and criminal legal systems that I've met along the way are more than just clients. They are my teachers. Because of them, I am a fiercer and more effective advocate. I have learned from them humility, resilience, and how to be joyful, even in moments of darkness. They ground me in my work and in my personal life. <laughs> I keep this pink ring with me for Joseph, uh, but also as a reminder of all that I have learned from them. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's such a joy to see everyone here in this room together and to feel the power of the public interest and public service community at Stanford Law School. It's these kinds of gatherings to hear from our alumni, to hear from other leaders in the field that give us an opportunity to reflect on the role of the legal profession in society and the obligation of lawyers to serve the interests of justice. And so after years of pandemic absence from this kind of in-person gathering, I think it's especially meaningful to be here together tonight. Before I introduce Sylvia Argueta, who will receive our National Public Service Award, I want to congratulate, acknowledge, and thank Nana for the work she's pursued, for the contribution she made to the law school when she was a student, and for providing such an inspiring role model to our current students. We at the law school always hope we're providing the foundations that will allow our students and graduates to make choices that not only allow them to thrive professionally, but also to find purpose and learn how to use the law to advance the public good. I also want to start by thanking everyone who's here tonight. First, by thanking the catering staff whose invisible work has enabled us to enjoy the delicious meal that we've all finished. To thank the alums for coming. to thank the alumni for coming to support our current students, and to thank the faculty and staff who were here, as well as the many students who have come this evening. I want to give particular thanks to the staff of the Levin Center, to Diane Shin, to Shafak Khan, T.D. Liu, Melanie Stone, Anna Wang, and Mike Wynn, 
for building the scaffolding and infrastructure at the law school so our students and alumni can do just that. It's my distinct pleasure this evening to introduce Sylvia Argueta, who has served as the Executive Director of the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles since 1999, and to present her with the Law School's National Public Service Award. Prior to becoming the leader of one of the most respected nonprofit legal organizations in the country, Sylvia cut her teeth as an impact litigator at the ACLU of Southern California, where she was part of the legal team that challenged California's anti-immigrant initiative, Proposition 187, and went on to MALDEF, the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund, where she brought substantial litigation to advance the education and employment rights of the Latinx community. Under Sylvia's leadership, LAFLA has expanded to serve a part of the state that has experienced dramatic demographic shifts in growth. Through five offices, four self-help centers, three domestic violence clinics, and with a staff of over 130 and a budget of over $40 million, LAFLA serves over 100,000 people living in poverty in the greater Los Angeles area. I can't sufficiently express how much I admire and how important I think direct civil legal services are in our society. The justice gap, the difference between those who cannot afford legal services to help them ensure their basic human needs are being met and the number of available lawyers to help them remains an entrenched and difficult problem. I'm so heartened by the number of our graduates who are choosing to join the legal aid community of lawyers directly after graduating from SLS to help keep people in their homes, to access the services and programs that they and their families need to maintain stable lives. The ability to provide all of these life-sustaining services was disrupted and yet all the more critical during the COVID-19 pandemic. As clients and legal aid lawyers alike confronted the varied aspects of the crisis that existed at the intersections of serving those with the fewest financial resources, the public health and hazardous employment conditions or wage theft faced by those deemed essential workers, maintaining housing while facing reduced or eliminated wages because of the shutdown, navigating new governmental programs and systems related to accessing workers' compensation, other forms of financial uh, support, eviction moratoria, the list goes on. It would have been sufficiently challenging if you were a lawyer or the leader of a nonprofit legal aid group trying to support clients through these intersecting crises if you could follow your normal in-office work routines and procedures, if the courts were operating fully and normally, if government agencies were staffed up and ready to be accessed. However, the pandemic and shutdown instead required those lawyers and organizational leaders to pivot quickly, to adjust themselves to new court procedures, to learn how to advocate virtually for their clients, to understand where and how to reach clients who could no longer come to offices. With Sylvia's nimble leadership, LAFLA quickly developed strategies to reach their clients' communities through the media, through, uh, so including social media, by creating new community-based partnerships. Simultaneously, Sylvia was recreating LAFLA's management structure and identifying the resources her staff needed in a new work-from-home environment and also recognizing the stress that was being experienced by both clients and staff. There were many balls that she had to juggle to ensure that their needs of her hometown community and the clients that she's so dedicated to were being met. Because of her leadership, commitment, and wisdom, her organization stood at the forefront of serving those in Los Angeles who were fighting to ensure that their most fundamental rights to healthcare, housing, education and employment benefits and basic needs were supported by lawyers to navigate complicated systems and bureaucracies. I know that a multitude of clients and their families weathered the storm of the pandemic because of her leadership. I'm so pleased and honored to present Sylvia with our 2022 National Public Service Award and to express Stanford's gratitude for her dedicated commitment to a career of service.
this is why Diane is my sister. Put it down. How are you all? Isn't it great to see each other in person? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you all very much for that, uh, Dean Martinez, for that generous introduction. I am truly humbled to be here tonight and to receive this award. Honestly, when, um, when I heard about it and I got uh, the Dean's email, I was like, what are they talking about? Do they know I didn't graduate from Stanford? Um, <laughs> Um, but I really am super humbled to be here. And um, thank you, Dean Martinez. Um, I'm really grateful. I also want to thank uh, Diane Chin and all of her team here at the Levine Center. You know, things about Diane that you should know that you probably do know, so I may be speaking to the choir, but I want to repeat it because I think it's important. You know, she worked with countless students and lawyers in public interest law and especially with organizations like mine, um, legal services organizations that provide direct representation. I think it's her belief that we should have a diverse community that has um, responds to the clients that we serve. So a pipeline of diverse lawyers, I think is incredibly important. And diversity in all of its tapestry that, that diversity can be. And, I, and for that, I applaud her and thank her. We rely on her work and um, the work of all of her colleagues um, to push forward an agenda of equal justice. So I know that um, Dean Martinez was so generous in that introduction about me, but I know that I'm not here because of me. It really isn't about me. Um, it's because I am privileged to be uh, the executive director of the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Without the work of the dedicated staff of LAFLA, as we lovingly call it, you wouldn't be listening to this speech. The people who I think are the rightful recipients of this award are the over 200 women and men of the organization who are my colleagues, my brothers, my sisters, sometimes my adversaries, but I love them still. <laughs> uh, they've dedicated their careers just as many of you want to, to do um, to helping the poorest among us, but also very importantly, to change to changing systems that keep people in poverty. Because it isn't it sick that in the richest nation in the world, we have so many people in, living in poverty. Earlier you heard how many people we help at LAFLA. Close to two million people in Los Angeles County qualify for LAFLA services. And we helped last year just a little over 100,000. Let that sink in over two million people living in poverty. That's outrageous. And we should be angry about that. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and how I got here and why I do this work. And then we'll go back about, we'll come back to that anger part because I think it's important and I think it's something that should drive us in what we do. So I came to the United States from Guatemala and I forgot to what a beautiful speech and beautiful work, Nanya, that you've done. Let's give it another round of applause for her. I am humbled, humbled. Always lovely to have a former ACLU lawyer having been one myself here, but the work you're doing is really, it's God's work, it's important work, and thank you so much. So I'm an immigrant. I came to the United States when I was uh, close to six years old. Um, I didn't speak a word of English. Um, uh, my family lived in South Central Los Angeles. My mom brought me to the United States because she was a young widow and she wanted a better life for me. So she came to the US two years ahead of me to see if she could stay, if she would stay, and she did. She worked as a maid for a family in Beverly Hills and she saved enough money to bring me to the United States. The immigration laws at that time were not as rigid as they are today and we're thankful and grateful for that. And that's why we seek change now, because it's ridiculous. My mom was able to remarry um, this wonderful man. Um, and uh, she tells the story that they got married at City Hall. And as soon as they were done, they headed over to the immigration notario and petitioned me so that I could come to the United States. My mom is, uh, ooh, I'm gonna get emotional. She's my rock. She's a solid small woman like me uh, who's taught me a lot, everything I know about integrity, love, and compassion. So we lived in South Central LA. 
I went to a school where they didn't have bilingual education that did not exist at the time. So I was a sink or swim kid. And I was put in a class for children with mental disabilities. For a month, we learned the word apple. And after a month, I told my dad, I said, I'm tired of this apple word, word that's all we learn, I don't know. And he went to the school and said, what are you doing? Um, and they said, she needs to learn how to speak English. And that's the only class they had for me. So he took it among, uh, upon himself to every morning buy um, a newspaper, the Herald Examiner. There used to be two competing newspapers in Los Angeles, the LA Times and the Herald Examiner. And every morning he'd wake me up really early and have me read one paragraph and sound it out. Now, this was notable because my dad is also limited English, was also limited English proficient. He, English was not his dominant language, yet he knew enough to sit me down and help me learn. He also let me watch uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons, and that was, the, that was the honey, right? If you do this, you can do that, all before school started. And he instilled in me um, a love for reading, a love for understanding, and he also taught me about pushing things and pushing the envelope. And he said, but school's not gonna help you, we're gonna help you and you're gonna help yourself. And that's what I did. I'm one of those persons who, uh, I'm, I was a nerd in school, I loved school, but I was not one of those people who wanted to be a lawyer when I was six. I hear people say that and I'm like, really? That's what you wanted to do? I wanted to be a singer. Too bad you need talent for that. Um, I never met a lawyer until I was at UCLA. And I'll tell you, I went to UCLA because my mom, that home in Beverly Hills where she worked, the two boys that lived there went to UCLA. So she would talk about that school. And my dad took us to visit that school. And I just thought it was a beautiful school. I didn't really understand much about academics even then in high school. But I'm like, I'm coming to this school. And thankfully, I was accepted. Um, to that school, and I was grateful. Um, I went on an internship um, between my third and fourth year at UCLA, and I met lawyers for the very first time. My intent in going to UCLA was to join the diplomatic corps. That's why one of my majors was French. Very bizarre, right? French in all the languages, but it was Spanish, French, and it was easy, because you know French, Spanish, Romance languages, it wasn't too hard. And I loved it. But then I met these lawyers, and I worked for the House Committee on Education and Labor. And one of the things they were doing that summer was listening to coal miners from Appalachia. Coal miners talked about the health problems they had, low wages, terrible housing. It was enthralling to me, because I could see how their story related to my family's story. Problems with housing, problems with wages, not getting paid enough, not being listened to. And something changed. Something changed dramatically in me. And I thought, I want to be one of these lawyers. I want to do what they're doing, because they were working on legislation to help these coal miners. Very odd, right? This young Guatemalan woman, immigrant woman, but I felt so close to this Appalachian coal miners, because I could see the problems, the issues that they faced were universal for poor people. And I think that's what set my trajectory into working in public interest law. I went to law school and only, only for the reason of working in public interest law. That's all I did from the beginning I, when I arrived at Hastings to now. I thought it was important to give back. My way of giving back was to join legal services organizations, to work with others. For those of you who are students still here, go work for a federal judge. I did, and it was very important. It was a great growth opportunity because she also was a huge public interest proponent. Surround yourselves by people who are like-minded, but will challenge you to do better, to be better. And I was very fortunate that that judge not only took me under her wing um, when I was working for her as an extern, I wasn't her law clerk, um, and she kept my career front and center throughout every job I've gotten. I go to her and ask her, what do you think? Should I do this? And she's always been there. Mentors are really important. So that's my side comment to all of you. Choose mentors, choose mentors carefully because they can guide you through a lot in your career. So my work is shaped by my experience as an immigrant woman. It's shaped by watching my parents get poorly treated by landlords and others. I was their interpreter 
So as a kid, you know everything that's going on in your parent's life because you're an interpreter. You have to help them navigate all of the issues that they're facing. And because of that, and later on, the experience I had as an extern in DC really shaped everything I would do later in life. I became a public interest lawyer, not to do good, but to make change. And I think that's what's important in the work that we do as public interest lawyers. Whether it's in direct services, like LAFLA does, whether it's impact work, like Nanya does, it all comes together. I think it's important to always remember that you have to be a channel for change. And the only way you can do that is if you get a little angry. And I saw some of you kind of cringe when I said how many people we helped versus how many people qualify for our services. You should be cringing, but then do something more. Because there's the cringe and the anger. And the anger has to be channeled into action. And I think that's what we do at LAFLA. I dare say that is what we do every single day. Our lawyers come to work ready to battle a landlord, a spouse who's hurting the other spouse, an agency who's so bureaucratic that the women and men who have fought wars for this country are being denied basic benefits. But everybody goes out in tears on 4th of July or Veterans Day, but they're not getting their benefits. They're on the streets of Los Angeles, houseless. They're being blamed for the rise in criminal behavior in Los Angeles and throughout the nation. But people forget, many of those people are veterans. Many of those people forget, these are hardworking people who just got down on their luck and lost their job. So every day the LAFLA staff come in and they try to change the conditions that cause that. At LAFLA we have a work group, which we call the Housing and Communities Work Group. And that work group does the impact litigation and policy work at the organization along with the other work groups. But they really focus on the policy and the litigation. We've been in a fight with the city of Los Angeles for years over houseless folks, taking away their possessions, not caring that that was the social security card, the only last bit of medicine that they had, and just sweeping it away because Angelinos don't like to look at homeless people on the streets. They don't like the houseless. Those tents, they're bothersome. Well, they should be. Because instead of having a conversation about affordable housing, we're talking about sweeps. And LAFLA is there suing the city of Los Angeles and winning, I might say, because you can't take away people's, you cannot take people's constitutional rights and have it be okay. The courts are sometimes our friends, but honestly, we've had good panels who see that just because people are poor does not mean that they don't have the Constitution behind them. And that's something that we forget as lawyers. Sometimes it's something I have to remind my staff who come in and tell me that thing, you know, I want to do good. If somebody says that to me at an interview, I'm like, you may not work out here. Because I want you kind of frothing out the mouth because you're so angry that there are houseless people living in tents in such a wealthy city like Los Angeles. I want you upset that veterans can't get their benefits, that seniors who've toiled their entire life cannot get and live off of the Social Security benefits that they so need and have earned. I want you to be upset that the immigrant cannot stay in this country even though they are the ones who kept us open during this pandemic. They were the essential workers. I want them to do something about that. I don't want them to just sit there and go, this is terrible. Yes, it is. Yes, you're kind of upset about it and you want to do good. No. What are you going to do about it? I think legal aid lawyers, direct services lawyers, had always been thought of as those people who did the direct cases, small cases, the eviction defense, a huge practice at LAFLA. But you weren't really making that larger impact. At LAFLA, that's not how we work. And I don't think that's how the profession should look at legal services. You should look at us as law reformers, as change makers, because that's what we do. That's what we, our calling is in public interest law, is to make change, to ensure that 
this doesn't become a revolving door where people come in over and over regarding the same problem. Because if you're seeing that, what we say at LAFLA is, what's causing that? It's not the individual. There's a bigger problem. There's a bigger policy. There's a bigger bureaucracy out there that we have to worry about. That's what public interest lawyers need to do. They need to look at the individual and say, is there a collective problem here? And how do we resolve that problem? And that's not just what we need to do. It's what we must do. Because our clients, as I said, are plenty. There are more poor people living in this country than should be. It is shameful. The justice gap study that was recently done by one of our funders, the Legal Services Corporation, shows that for every person that legal services organizations throughout this country help, one gets turned down. It's a one in one. That is shameful. That is completely shameful for this country to allow that to happen. And that's why legal aid lawyers, public interest lawyers are needed. We can't let that continue. That ha there has to be change. Over 50 years ago, people used to think of legal aid lawyers as ones who didn't go to the Ninth Circuit, to the Supreme Court. We've changed that. And not just at LAFLA, but throughout the country. Those are the lawyers who are making change. Those are the lawyers who should be going to court. Those are the lawyers who should be challenging laws. And I tell you this, you are the people who carry the mantle of change for every poor person that lives in this country. They need you now more than ever. Just because they don't have enough cash in their pockets to afford a lawyer that they can pay doesn't mean that their rights are less than. Equal justice means just that, equal justice. If you don't have access, then there is no such thing. That facade on the Supreme Court that says equal justice under law is meaningless if just because you're poor, you don't have access. If just because you're poor, you're not gonna have a lawyer. We need to change that. And I think that I'm in a room of optimists, people who think, that's right, we're going to change that. We're going to make things different. Because, not only because we have to, because it's imperative. You know, justice in this country in the last year or so has been challenged. But one thing that remains is the fact that we, in the public interest community, we uphold the values of why we became lawyers in the first place. We believe in justice. We believe that no matter who you are, your race, your ethnicity, your class, you have a right to a lawyer. Inching our way to civil Gideon, as the folks in my table, there are challenges with that. But is it needed? Of course it is. It's imperative that we do that. At LAFLA, we represent low-income families, individuals. We ensure that people are heard. We give agency to our clients. We practice community lawyering. We say we work with our clients, not for our clients, because they need a voice. So I was so pleased to hear Nanya say how she, the relationship that she built with her client, that's an amazing lawyer, because that's what we need. People who don't just go, I've got my law degree and I know everything. You know nothing when you come out of law school, sorry. Sorry, not to, nothing to the professors here at Stanford, but all of us at any school. When you start practicing, it is hard, and you gotta jump right in. So jump right in and do it. I gotta tell you, you can be trained, and you are being trained at a magnificent law school, but you also have to remember that when you deal with the day-to-day, -day, it's gonna be hard. Oh, trust me, it will be. I can tell you, I did my first deposition as a brand new lawyer, having never seen one, and it was, a joke, because I objected to everything. I think I objected to the client's name as overbroad. <laughs> I went back to the, to the public interest firm that I worked at, and one of the partners said, how could you send her in there without her having seen a, a depo? And, and the other one was like, so she'll learn. I learned, I learned quickly to ensure that I could actually represent the client as he deserved. So yes, law school, you get great training ground. That's why clinical programs are important. That's why externships are important. That's why being a part of the broader legal community is indeed important. So you can learn, so you can be hands-on, 
And so you can see that the lived experience that your clients are going to have is as important as your learning and at institutions like this. I think that's what is important in the work that we do. As I mentioned, most legal services didn't used to go to the Supreme Court, but now they do. At LAFLA, we have, we believe in law and policy reform. We embrace it as our highest calling. We have the view that we have a duty to alter the legal conditions that perpetuate our clients' distress. We plant, we hope, seeds of justice and hope every day. They inspire us. Our clients are front and center in everything that we do, and they should be in your practice as a public interest lawyer, whether you present, represent an individual or a group of people. It's important that you center your work around your clients. It's important that you learn from each other, that you talk to each other, that you understand that you're in it, not just as your organization, if you go on to work at a legal services organization or a big one, a big uh, impact uh, uh, litigation firm like the ACLU or MALDEF. Everything relates to each other. When I was an attorney at the ACLU and had the opportunity to work with brilliant lawyers there and at MALDEF, one of the things that I did there was when we worked on Prop 187, which was the proposition that sought to take away education and many rights from um, immigrants, I was in charge of clients. Um, and I had to go and meet clients. And the lead client in the ACLU's case um, was a little boy who was at home and got into the cupboards and unfortunately drank some Drano. He had encephalitis when I met him at the hospital. There were lawyers at the ACLU who told me, did you get the client? Did you sign up the parents? No. This went on for about two weeks. And that litigation was moving quickly because we knew the election was coming. We knew we were likely going to lose. And we knew that we had to be in court the next morning on a TRO. But I couldn't sign up that client because I had to allow the parents the time to think through whether they would join this litigation to undocumented individuals with their little boy in an ICU because his brain was swollen. I had to respect who they were and what they were doing. That's what lawyers have to do when you're working with clients. You respect what they're going through. You try to understand it. And that's what I did for two weeks. The parents finally decided one morning, as I went to visit them at the hospital, they said, OK, we don't want this to ever happen to anyone else. And if our son's going to be thrown out of the hospital because we're undocumented, let's challenge it, Sylvia. And we signed them up. We won our TRO the day after this proposition passed. But some of my fellow lawyers never met the little boy. I named him Gregorio. That was his doe. Instead of, you know, John Doe, he was Gregorio uh, Doe. He was named after my grandfather. And I did that because I wanted to honor my grandfather, but I also wanted, we needed to not obviously use his name. And I told the parents, and they liked the story, and that's why they let me use that name. I gave the parents some measure of control at a moment when they were feeling like their world was falling apart as their little boy was in that ICU bed. I never understood why some of the lawyers didn't want to meet him or his parents, but they didn't. And I think that for the rest of their careers, I hope they've regretted that because he's now a vibrant young man who I had the pleasure of meeting about five years ago, again, as a young man. And I was like, oh my god. Um, I told him he was tall, but then everybody's tall to me, right? Um, a great young man, having a good life, expecting his own child. I stayed in touch with the parents sporadically, and I was so pleased to be able to make that change for them, to be a part of that amazing litigation with lawyers who are brilliant in court. But I also never forgot that there were some who were like, but that's not my work. So in the work that we do in direct legal services at LAFLA, we say, no, we don't give our clients up to anyone. If that 
big organization wants you and they want you to get, send a client, don't do it. Tell them, we'd like to join your litigation. We want to be a part of that because people are not fungible. People are not to be passed around in legal circles to go, oh, do you have a client that fits this? Because that would be the best client. That's not what people are. And I hope you remember that as you represent folks, as you work with them. That's why, honestly, Nanya, I'm so touched by the ring because it means that you see your clients. And honestly, that's what poor people need. They need to be seen. Most poor people are black, brown, Asian, LGBT. They don't get a say in what happens to them. There are laws, there are policies, there are regulations that are passed that keep them in poverty. So be angry and challenge those. Take up the mantle of anger. Do something about it. Because yes, it's good to be angry, but it's all even better to then take some action and make a change for the people who most deserve it. Never be condescending to your clients. Understand that you could be them. It's just happenstance that you're not. And I think, most importantly, understand that you've chosen this career as a public interest lawyer, if that's what you're going to do. And with that comes great responsibility because clients will respect you. They know you have learned something that they don't know and that you can help them. But they also know that you don't have their lived experience. So respecting that and learning how to be a good ad advocate is channel, 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 channeling the outrage. You may get angry when you're watching the news, right? You watch Fox News, Fox News, you get angry. We know that. In legal aid lawyers, we're an angry bunch sometimes. We have a lot of emotions, you know? We get so angry, we get wrinkles but we don't let that impede our work. That anger has to fuel our courage and commitment to do better by the people that we represent. We shouldn't be sad. We should be angry. Don't feel shocked that there are so many people that are houseless. Get angry about it and do something. Don't be shocked that Los Angeles has close to two million poor people. Get angry and do something, or anywhere, here. East Palo Alto. You have to get angry and then do something. You can't just sit there and go, that's terrible. I'm so mad at so-and-so on the television. That so-and-so isn't hearing you, so you better do something different. And I think that's why you've chosen this, this public interest world that you want to live in, that you want to be a part of, and we welcome you with open arms because we need more warriors. We need more people in this profession who do public interest work. It's imperative that we have more of you joining our ranks every day. It really is. I love speaking to summer students because they, to me, are joyful. They are the future. They are what will keep us going into the future to make change. And this generation, you guys are no BS. I wish I had the courage and the stamina and just your chutzpah. You've shown us, those of us who've been doing this in the trenches for so many years, that you really are channels for change. And for that, we are so incredibly, incredibly honored. So as advocates, I ask that you be analytical, that you devise strategies with a cool eye, and that you take action, and that you sustain it on behalf of the powerless, that you support the values of equality and justice by your actions that we do what is right and necessary, that we remember justice, she wields a sword. We must work to change fundamentally a system that has callous neglect towards those people living on the streets. So I hope that when you leave here today, your heart is ignited with a little bit of anger and fury so that you begin to make change. The path to justice may be long, but our resolve to ensure and protect the rights of those marginalized communities and those vilified, the poor, is the only, worth, is the only fight worth fighting. Thank you so much. I'm so terribly honored. Thank you, Nana.
and Sylvia for your inspiring remarks and for being with us tonight. This signifies the end of our program. I would like folks to check in with one another as you're heading out to make sure that nobody's walking home alone or walking alone um, in the dark. So please do check in if you think that somebody might need a companion um, to walk with tonight. Um, thank you for being with us. Thank you for celebrating public service and public interest law in this moment when we need the legal system to protect um, not just our rights, but to protect our democracy. So thank you so much for being with us tonight, and we look forward to being with you again very soon. Bye-bye.